So it's my pleasure today to be here with you to have this talk. I would like to thank Canon for his its support during this Congress. And uh, we will talk about cerebellar hypoplasia. And in particular, what's new, if we can say that there are new things about cerebellar hypoplasia. Let's start with this. Maybe we have to turn off the light in order... I would like to ask you, what do you think about this image? Do you think that there is cerebellar hypoplasia in this particular case? Can you see... Maybe we have to turn off the light in order... No? What do you think about that, about the cerebellum here? Do you think is there any hypoplasia? No, the cerebellum looks normal? No, yes, I don't know. Something not really normal right here. Hmm? Okay, so let's go a little bit down uh, word. And you will see that here is the cerebellar hemisphere, the other cerebellar hemisphere. And when you see the MRI, what can you see? What can you say? Is there any hypoplasia? Yes? Like a cyst. Like a cyst. But you cannot distinguish properly the, the other hemisphere. Okay, so there is a normal hemisphere here, here, and the other one is smaller. So, asymmetry, which means that there is focal hypoplasia. Okay, we don't want to go into the etiology, but just to describe the images. What about the other? <laughs> Cerebellum. What do you think about this? Do you need other information? It's a patient who is in, at 28 weeks and 5 days of gestation. Small. I didn't tell you how much the measurement of the cerebellum. Can you say anything about the cerebellum, posterior fossa, at this stage? If you want to say if it's small or not, what do you need? The measurement. Okay. So, the measurement of this cerebellum is 26 millimeters for 28.5 days. It's small. Okay? So, if you don't measure, you won't know that it's small because he got a normal morphology, a normal anatomy. You agree or not? Okay. So this was the vermis, because when you, you, you agree that when you have an abnormal image, you have to complete it by another point of view. So for the cerebellum, you will go further and make a sagittal view. So I, will show you, I showed you the sagittal view. What do you think about this vermis? It will be easier if I show you a normal one. Hmm. Well, I can say that it's a little bit smaller than the other one. Hmm. And the measurement is smaller. Okay, so here we have a cerebr cerebellar hypoplasia, global cerebellar hypoplasia, including the hemispheres and the vermis. Okay, what about this one? It's maybe... Do you think that this is hypoplasia? And I will even show you more. Hmm. The transverse cerebellar diameter is smaller than usual. So, if we look at the definition, yeah, it's small. It's a small TCD, but there is something else on the image.
a mall artist, Monique is right. The peduncles are not, the false ventricle is not normal because usually he does, doesn't have this shape. It's triangle and now it's abnormal shape for the fourth ventricle and the peduncles are abnormal. And when you go through uh, magnification of the image, so you can make the diagnosis of molar teeth, which is related to Joubert syndrome, okay? So this is a Joubert syndrome. Do you consider this as cerebellar hypoplasia? Uh, you will say it's cerebellar hypoplasia or it's Joubert syndrome? What do you think? What would you say? In your because you have to, to tell the genetician, everybody with whom you are working with, do you tell them I have a small cerebellum or more? This is the question. <laughs> okay, let's go to this one. Believe me, it's a reduced transcerebellar diameter. So, what do you think about the cerebellum? Normal, abnormal, only small? Abnormal. What? Anatomically, and what, what, how can you describe the anatomy? If you can, huh? maybe. Yeah, the vermis is not well defined. Okay, so, yeah, so it's difficult to say if you can really see the two lobes and the, and the vermis. You're right, so you do a coronal view, and within the coronal view, you will see, you see this. So, this is one folia, transverse folia, foliation, and here you can make the diagnosis of Rhombencephalosynapsis. Okay, so all this is just to tell you that to introduce cerebellar hypoplasia because cerebellar hypoplasia is a really, it englobes a wide spectrum of neuroradiologic features, of several etiologies, several clinical characteristics, and too many neurodevelopmental uh, deficits. So it makes it very, very difficult to be, um, to have a great, uh, you know, um, prenatal counseling when facing cerebellar hypoplasia because there is a real decrepancy between prenatal and, and postnatal literature and there is no consensus until, uh, until now regarding the classification of cerebellar hypoplasia. So all these cases that I show you, in a how we can talk about cerebellar hypoplasia, but if you describe a Joubert syndrome and a rhombencephalosynapsis and a focal cerebellar hypoplasia at the same entity called cerebellar hypoplasia, you, will, you, you won't be able to go further in a proper way. So let's try to make things a little bit clearer. Cerebellar hypoplasia, if we go to the definition, it's a cerebellum of reduced volume with conserved shape. When most, uh, the, the most important part of the literature regarding cerebellar hypoplasia is from the postnatal period. And when you have a postnatal uh, epigetric literature, it means that the babies, the infants, are sick. They go to the pediatrician, to a neuroradiologist, and they perform ultrasound, they perform MRI, and they found that the baby have, has cerebellar hypoplasia. While during the prenatal period, it's not at all the same thing. Because when you explore the, the, you know, the, uh, the fetal head, you go through the transcerebellar plan, and usually, if you uh, follow the guidelines of the ISYOG, you, you're not, it's not mandatory to measure the transverse cerebellum diameter. You only have to have a look to make sure that the posterior fossa is almost normal. That's all. And you're not even 
uh, obliged to make a sagittal view, which means that the vermis, you're not supposed to look at it, okay? So if you diagnose cerebellar hypoplasia with a reduced volume of the cerebellum during prenatal period, it's really difficult because you will go and see the literature on postnatal uh, conditions. And this is really confusing because prenatal counseling is really difficult in these cases. So in order to make, um, to, to uh, be, to explore properly the posterior fossa. In 2006, Laurent Guibault and Vincent Desportes proposed an anatomical approach in order to explore anatomically with accurately the posterior fossa in order to describe properly entities that are more homogeneous. Okay, so they defined anomalies of posterior fossa on a routine ultrasound exploration because in routine you're not supposed to do the posterior, the sagittal posterior view of the vermis. You only have to do the transcerebellar plane. So they divided the anomalies into three categories. The increased uh, fluid-filled space of the posterior fossa, which means that this fluid space is enlarged. This is its category. Another category that comprises the decreased biometry of the cerebellum, which means that if you have a decreased biometry, it means that you measured and this measurement is decreased. And the third one is about the abnormal anatomy. And the anatomy, the normal anatomy of the posterior fossa is defined by two cerebellar hemispheres, as you see here, separated by the vermis, which is more echogenic than the hemispheres, and the fourth ventricle in front of the vermis. And behind the vermis, you have the fluid filled space, the uh, cisterna magna, which must, doesn't have to be enlarged, lower than 10 millimeters if you have a doubt. You measure here in the, in the deepest axis, you measure if it's below 10 millimeters, it's no. So that's the normal anatomy of the posterior fossa. So we have three categories of anomalies and in my topic, I will only focus on the decreased biometry, because we are talking about cerebellar hypoplasia. But, but when you go into literature, all, that, all these entities are, they are matched into cerebellar hypoplasia. That's why genetic counseling, prenatal counseling is very difficult in these, it's challenging in these cases because you mix different pathologies with different etiologies and in, in consequence, different uh, clinical uh, impact and neurodevelopmental impact. Especially that cerebellar hypoplasia is most of the time associated with a very uh, important neurodevelopmental delay in the literature. That means that when you talk about cerebellar hypoplasia to patients, you know that they will be really uh, anxious about the, develop the developmental, the long-term developmental, uh, cognitive developmental, motor developmental, and uh, um, uh, executive developmental, uh, uh, the developmental um, of the baby, skills of the baby. So, what are the guidelines? The guidelines uh, in France and in the international, uh, international society, do, do they do not recommend to measure the cerebellum. While all the literature is, um, is um, if, uh, we know that the diagnosis of posterior fossa, uh, we underestimate the anomalies of posterior fossa. And if we want, to improve our detection of anomalies of the posterior fossa, we have to measure the transverse diameter of the cerebellum. So this is the main question. Do we have to measure? Who here in the audience ha make the measurement of the cerebellum, the diameter of the cerebellum? 
That's great. Okay. So, if you measure the transverse diameter and this diameter is reduced, you will complete the image by a sagittal view. And then, in case of cerebellar hypoplasia, three cases, three uh, sort of cases. Either you have a focal hypoplasia, which means that the reduction of volume concerned only one hemisphere. Either you have a global hypoplasia, and in this case, the anatomy is strictly normal. So if you don't measure, you won't be aware that there is a cerebellar hypoplasia. And here you have a vermis, a vermian hypoplasia. This is a more tricky situation because in these cases, sometimes the transverse cerebellar diameter is nearly normal or around, you know, seven, eight um, percentile. And if you do not, do not go into the sagittal view, maybe you won't uh, make the diagnosis. That's why it's important to look at the shape of the fourth ventricle. Let's talk about the focal cerebellar hypoplasia. This is not new. We already published about these cases. We, you know, you see the decreased biometry, you look at the anatomy, and from this you will see that the reduction concerns only one hemisphere. So, we know that in these cases, pathologies, they are typical, clastic, disruptive etiologies. And in few cases, we published a big series of uh, focal reduction of, uh, of unilateral cerebellar hypoplasia, and we, um, we, demonstra we demonstrated that the loss of volume of the cerebellar hemisphere is not correlated with a poor diagnosis, okay, in these infants. Because we have a series, we published a series of 26 aces, uh, cases of unilateral cerebellar hypoplasia. We demonstrated that in the most of the cases that it is of um, clastic disruptive etiology, hemorrhagic, infectious, and the prognosis it's, is not related to the volume loss of the hemisphere, but in the several cases when we have an hypoplasia of the vermis, we couldn't be really confident with the, with, the, with the parents because we know that the reduction of the volume of the posterior part of the vermis is correlated in the literature regarding small cases for sure, but that's what we have in our possession, to a uh, poor prognosis cognitive one. So, in focal cerebellar hypoplasia, most of the time it is of a disruptive etiology. In some cases, and this, is, this was a really new information, um, a focal reduction associated with a cyst, it could be a sign of face syndrome. And after our publication, uh, Zvika Lebovich in Israel published a series from based on our uh, description of these cases, and he collected all the cases of face syndrome, and he found that all the babies during prenatal period had the same pattern of asymmetry of the cerebellar um, hemispheres, and it took the shape of a tilted telephone receiver, and that make you uh, suggest the diagnosis of face syndrome, which um, lets you go and see the, cal the, you know, all the vasculariz vascularization of the polygon of Willis and all the heart exploration in order to have a more accurate diagnosis of face syndrome. But we have to suggest this diagnosis when facing unilateral cerebellar hypoplasia with this special pattern on MRI. Okay, so this is focal reduction. What about the global uh, cerebellar hypoplasia? This is more tricky, more difficult. Why? Because sometimes if we don't measure, if we don't have any other anomalies, we cannot make the diagnosis. Okay, 
But once you measure and you have a reduction of the transverse cerebellar diameters, what are you going to do? But you are going to, first of all, make a sagittal posterior, posterior view in order to examine the vermis properly, the height of the vermis and the shape. And the brainstem, we can see it here. And it has, you know, these echogenic and hypoechogenic uh, structure, shape, morphology of the brainstem. And then you will check properly the whole uh, um, brain and to, to see if there is any associated anomalies regarding the cortical surface, the sulci, and ventriculomegaly, the corpus callosum, all the associated anomalies in the central nervous system. And you will perform for sure um, a morphologic, a mor morpho morphological examination in order to see if there is any associated anomalies. To go, uh, in order to examine more deeply this uh, cerebellar hypoplasia, you have to perform an MRI. It is, why do you think we, have, we do MRI in cerebellar hypoplasia? Is it for the cerebellum or for the other organ in the posterior fossa? Yeah, it is for mainly for the brainstem because cerebellar hypoplasia some, sometimes is associated with a hypoplasia of the brainstem, which means that we are in the spectrum of pontocerebellar hypoplasia. These are rare entities, but we have to eliminate them because these are of genetic origin, poor prognosis, and different pathology. So it's really important to make sure that we are not in the case of pontocerebellar hypoplasia and we have isolated cerebellar hypoplasia. And the other thing that we have to check is for sure the cortex that we can see more properly with the MRI. Okay, so once we have, we suspect a cerebellar hypoplasia, first of all, we will confirm the diagnosis doing ultrasound MRI. We will check the vermis, the cerebellar hem hemispheres, brainstem, associated CNS anomalies, other anomalies, and then we'll go through the etiologic diagnosis. Is there any risk factors for disruption? Alcohol, drugs, some medications? Consanguinity, because in some rare cases, there are recessive autosomic uh, genetic diseases, but very rare, that concern cerebellar hypoplasia. And in this particular case, cerebellar hypoplasia will appear during the third trimester. Okay? So you will search for risk factors. CMV infection, because you know that cerebellar hypoplasia is a prognostic factor of poor neurodevelopmental um, outcome in the CMV, maternal-fetal CMV infection. And then I think that it's mandatory to do the ACPA and, if you can, the whole exome uh, sequencing because there are a lot of mutation, genetic mutation involved in cerebellar hypoplasia and mainly uh, are described mutation in the, in the gene CASC, OPHN1, ZIK124, the three mainly, and Fox C1. Okay, so once we did this and we have a, an isolated cerebellar hypoplasia, what are we going to do? And is it worth it to do all this? So we tried, based on a huge database that we have in our unit, to know what is the history of a small cerebellum from the prenatal period in order to go, it, to go and follow this small cerebellum till the postnatal period, because we don't have data in the literature of this series where you follow up the small cerebellum from the prenatal to the postnatal period. First of all, we, we have shown in a previous paper that the TCD measurement is feasible and reliable during ultrasound examination by senior and junior examinators and during the second and the third trimester. Okay, so it is, we can do it. So the first of all, we have to measure it. And once we measure the, the cerebellum, 
what are we going to do? We followed all the series. We had more than uh, 470, uh, 437 cases of small cerebellum. And we tried to cerebellum diagnose during routine ultrasound. And we tried to know what is the outcome of these fetuses. Well, we demonstrated that a small cerebellum is associated with several anomalies. It's really, it might be a trigger to go into morphological, uh, to, to refer the patients in order to have um, uh, a, diagnostic, a diagnostic examination because it is associated with major malformations in a significant percentage of cases. We divided our groups into three groups regarding the severity of the uh, transfer diameter, uh, the cerebellar diameter. If it is below the fifth percentile, below the third percentile, and below the first percentile. And deeper you go and more the uh, malformations are associated with these small cerebellum. Anyhow, even though the cerebellum is between the third and the fifth percentile, it is associated with a significant uh, percentage of anomalies, major anomalies, cardiac anomalies and other anomalies, and chromosomal anomalies. So we demonstrated in this paper that the threshold to refer patients is the fifth percentile, because until now, we didn't know what is the limit below which we have to define cerebellar hypoplasia. It was completely subjective. In the postnatal period, there is no threshold. People subjectively notice that the cerebellum is small and they go forward. So we demonstrated that below the fifth percentile, you have to refer patients and to perform extra examination in order to see, uh, to explore this fetus. Okay, so we had the remaining patients who does not have associated anomalies. And we followed a series of 37 patients, uh, 37, yeah, 35, sorry, uh, infants who had very small and small cerebellum during the prenatal period. Isolated one, nothing associated, no other anomaly. And we showed they didn't have a neurological pathology. They are not followed out, all the 35 patients. They are not followed by neuropediatrician. Uh, they do not have autistic spectrum uh, disorder because nowadays when we talk about the cerebellum, one of the major main pathology that we can talk about is the cerebellum hy uh, cerebellar hypoplasia. Well, in our series of 35 infants that we infants that we followed from the prenatal to the postnatal period, we didn't have any case of a spectrum of uh, autism, neither severe uh, hypoplasia like the cases described in the postnatal period. Nevertheless. They are not, 20% of the cases are really normal. The other cases have cerebellar syndrome. They have deficits in, fun, deficits. They have high risk to very high risk of language disability, motor, fine motor, global mo uh, motor disability, and socially based. Oh, socialization. Uh, difficulties, but they are not, they don't have deficit in cognitive in intelligence. That means that we're not sure. Ah, it's over. Okay, I talk a lot. Sorry, but okay, okay, let's go to the. Um, I have too much to say about cerebellum. Uh, okay, so what we can say is that we're not sure that. Small cerebellum that during the prenatal period correspond to the same entity of cerebellar hypoplasia described in the postnatal period. First of all, you have to measure the cerebellum. Second, when it's below the fifth percentile, you have to do a systematic uh, analysis of the whole morphology. You have to propose the 
uh, ACPA and even more uh, sequencing of the exome and isolated global cerebellar hypoplasia with negative workup might be associated with a normal uh, development, uh, the development and is not always associated to a severe delay. Okay, and we had, in order to improve the prenatal counseling, made a correlation between the head circumference and the TCD. In these particular cases of limit small cerebellum, isolated one, in order to correlate the cerebellum to the head circumference, to um, in some cases of sp small cerebellum with a small TCD. Thank you. Thank you.